Hello everybody, welcome back to Friday's Live. This is the nice and relaxing family history session where we talk about fun and past new records. We talk about your amazing discoveries and it's a place where we can come together and, and have a bit of a chat, really. Uh, my name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. It means I work with things like social media and community and I get to chat to all of you lovely people on a regular basis. Um, so that's really nice. Um, please bear with me today. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. Um, so just go easy on me. Um, I do have a packed agenda for you. We're going to look at the new records and newspapers from this week. We are going to do a mini tutorial on a particular tree feature that I love. And I think if I can just tell, I can teach at least one person that this is a handy feature and that you can make use of it, I will be very, very happy. We will also do question of the week. And question of the week this week is, let me just pop it on screen. Who is your most inspiring female ancestor and why? Because it is, of course, Women's History Month this March. Um, it's International Women's Day next week, which is really exciting. So that's question of the week this week. This is what I want to hear. I want to hear about all your wonderful female ancestors. Uh, we're also going to have a look at some awesome Welsh women because it is Women's History Month um, and it was St David's Day this week. I thought it would be really cool to share with you some wonderful Welsh women from history who you might not have heard of you may have heard of like one or two but I I challenge if, if anybody's heard of all four of these women um I will be very very impressed because there was one of them that I had only not quite heard of but quite understood the significance of only about a month ago so that would be really interesting. We've got Thomas with us in the comments today. So please say hi to him. He's just back from the dentist and uh, he was uh, around to do comments for me, which was good. So thank you, Thomas. Um, let's welcome some of you. Uh, we've got Karen joining us from a cold Enfield in North London. It's cold in Scotland, actually. It's, it's cold. I took, sort of just want to wrap a blanket around myself. Uh, hello, Matt. Happy Friday to you as well. I'm so excited to relax over the weekend. I'm very excited. Hello, Andrew from Stoke-on-Trent. We've got Sue joining us from Guildford. Lovely Guildford. Donna from Kent. Hello. We've got Joe. We've got Sally. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got Gina. Gina, I hope you had a lovely birthday and uh, that you are enjoying the book that you won, the, uh, the Dress Diary book. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, we've got Liam joining us. Uh, he says uh, they're very busy in customer support today, so he might not be able to stick around for the whole thing. That's OK. That's OK. Uh, helping all of our lovely customers. Uh, we've got Daphne joining us from a chilly Somerset. It's cold everywhere. Goodness me. Uh, we've got Roz joining us from Massachusetts. Guessing another storm. Oh, stay safe, Roz. We've got Georgia, Rosie. Mike, there's lots of you here, so this is wonderful. Um, yeah, this is fantastic. Uh, Sarah saying, taking a bit break from catching up on Roots Tech. Hi from Wexford. Yes, it's Roots Tech this week. Really, really exciting. A couple of other Farmer Pass team have gone over for that, and we keep getting little updates back from them. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're at Roots Tech, um, if you're there in person or you're joining some of the online sessions, let us know because um, Roots Tech is really fun. Um, we've got Anya joining us from Lovely Sunny Five. Yes, lots of Roots Tech. Fantastic. OK, lots of you here. Um, it's um, for Bob. It's minus two in the Comax Valley on Vancouver Island. It is cold. Yeah, oh, Miko, I miss Miko. Yes, fantastic. Yes, you did have a good birthday. I'm so pleased. Lovely. OK. Right. Um, shall we jump right in then? Let's. Um, oh, before I do new records, there is one thing I wanted to do. Um, let me just pop that up there. So you might have seen on our social media channels, we are running our very first uh, Family History Fundamentals Month. What does this mean? It means that we're going to be sharing content aimed at inspiring people interested in their, their family history to get stuck in. Uh, we're going to be sharing tips on how to get started. But on the back of that, we're also going to be sharing tips for how you can hone the skills you already have 
hacks to get you further and faster with your family tree. Uh, we're going to need your help for this as well because you guys are already you're already so good at what you do you're already making amazing discoveries and we want to we want to help other people who want to come and join our community to find those discoveries uh, as quickly as they can and you know start building their family tree and in this community we don't gatekeep we share our tips and tricks and hacks and things like that um so we're going to be asking you to share your tips and advice in the hope that you will inspire and help somebody else that is the plan. Okay. Um, and lastly, and if Thomas, if you could pop a link to this in the chat for me. So we have a new way for you to share your amazing discoveries with us. It's our share your story form. Um, and if Thomas could pop a link in, you'll be able to see if you open up, you can add in as little or as much detail as you like about a family history discovery that's meant a lot to you, or maybe it was a a brick wall that you'd had for many years and you'd finally broken it down or there was one little record that just unlocked everything it could be anything anything that is important to you and that you would like to share and talk to us about in a little bit more detail um there's also the opportunity on that form if you want to maybe come and chat to me we can do a little video interview and we can we can talk about your discovery and how that made you feel and things like that so it's the option to opt in for that if you'd like if you want to come and talk to me about that um so yeah that's exciting stuff come and tell us all about your wonderful discoveries lovely okay let's do new records shall we because we've got a lot to get through this week um, new this week, we have Nottingham Catholic records, baptisms, marriages, burials and congregational records. We also have a new record set called The Legacies of British Slavery. And then we have 55 newspaper titles that have been updated. Let's do the Nottingham records first. So um, these have been added into the baptisms, marriages, burials and congregational records for the England Roman Catholic records. All you need to do is Go to the England Roman Catholic records and choose one of the four, um, whether it's baptisms, marriages, etc. And just add in Nottingham as your diocese and you'll be able to see all these lovely new Nottingham records. You get the transcript and the image. The baptisms, there's over 77,000 of these. Um, marriages, over 16,000. Burials, over 20,000. And then the congregational records, over 29,000. The earliest record we have is a baptism record, and that's that's in 1641. And then they all run up to 1913 for the four different types. The uh, Nottingham uh, Diocese and Archives cover Nottingham, Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire and Rutland. Um, so don't think, oh, I don't have Nottingham ancestors. I'm not going to find anybody in here. They actually cover other counties as well. The diocese do. Um, so I would definitely check these out if you've got Midland, at least East Midland ancestors. It's going to be a really good record set for you to have a look at. Um, and bear in mind, they will probably, I think, I want, don't want to say they're all going to be in Latin because there are probably going to be exceptions, but I would imagine most of them will be in Latin. Um, you can find really, really rich biographical information. You can get your, your names, your dates. Um, you can sometimes get uh, the parents' names for the baptisms. You can get godparents for the marriages. You can get uh, witnesses' names and things like that. And I thought it might be fun to break down some of these so you know what to expect in these records. And this is this one we've got on screen right now. This is a baptism record. And my Latin is is not good. Um, I did Latin during my master's, but uh, I've forgotten most of it. Uh, luckily, I mean, these are quite formulaic, so you can normally break them down. So um, I've translated bits of this for you. So you've got the baptism date of the 26th of November. You've got the name of William Molyneux. You've got the date of birth, also handy, 11th of January 1884. And you can see there's quite a discrepancy there between the the um, date of birth. That should be the way around. It should be. It definitely should be the other way around. I've mixed that up. You can tell I'm not well, um, but you get the gist. Um, you've got the father's name, the mother's name, plus her maiden name, super handy. And then you've got the godfather as well. Let's have a look at marriage. 
Um, so you've got the marriage date, you've got the um, the first party and then who he's the son of. Then you've got who he's marrying and who she's the daughter of. You've got the witnesses. There's normally two witnesses. And then you've also got the name of the, the priest as well, which I thought was quite cool. Um, I quite like seeing that. I really like looking at witnesses and godparents on baptism and marriage records. I think they can unlock so much and it can it can if if you're not sure if you've got the right family for example you know so, so sometimes in your family tree you're working with quite common names i know that better than anyone i have jones i have smith if you look at these um godparents names and marriage witness names you can sometimes see if you're on the right track um it could be you know an aunt or an uncle it could be a cousin it could be a sibling really really handy so definitely look at the original images for these they are really really useful and then this is a this is a burial record so this is for uh, a lady called Anna Dobbs uh, she was 51 when she died in 1904 um, it gives us her residence her burial date um, which was only four days after she died um, I did have to look this up. I wondered what the um, the coem novo meant in Latin. And it literally means buried in a new place, I think. Um, but in this context, it means buried in the new cemetery. So rather than the new existing one, they've just had a new one. It just says where she's actually buried, which is quite useful. So there we go. Those are the Nottingham Catholic record. Let me know if you dig into these this weekend, if you find some good stuff in there and make some good discoveries. Yeah, I really like Catholic records. Uh, we have a lot of them on Farmer Past and the collection is only growing. And I don't know whether I can tell you this or not. I'm probably going to get told off. We've got more coming soon as well. And I maybe got to see them, the actual records, which was really nice. Um, so there's more coming. Don't know exactly when though. Okay, right, next up, Legacies of British Slavery. Okay, so I'm not going to touch on this one too much because really exciting, I am going to be chatting to Jessica Hanna from the Legacies of British Slavery Project at University College London next week. So this is going to be on Thursday the 9th. It's going to be at the earlier time of 2 p.m. UK time. And um, we're going to be delving into a little bit more detail about the context and what these records actually are. So for now, I'm not going to dwell on them for too long. Um, but a little bit of context for you. So in 1833, the British government abolished slavery in the British Empire with the Slavery Abolition Act. And with that act, £20 million at the time, £20 million, I think, uh, in compensation was provided to those who were involved in the slave trade in some way. Um, they were compensated for their losses. So what these records are, these comprise those who've received one of these payments. Um, that could be a big payment. It could be a small, tiny, tiny payment. It doesn't matter. There is actually some suggestion, I don't know how substantiated this claim is, that the loan taken out by the government at the time to pay for this compensation was not paid off by British taxpayers until 2015. Anywho, um, in terms of the information you're going to find, um, you'll normally find a name, date of birth, you may find occupation, and maybe like a spouse's name, whether they have children, um, there might be a mini biography. Um, but what you want to do is you want to go onto the transcript and then click the source website. That takes you to the UCL Legacies of British Slavery Projects website, and you'll get more detail again. So, this one here um, is for um, Henry Lassells, the second Earl of Harewood. Um, and we get his birth date, his death date, his father's name, spouse's name, um, her maiden name, which is quite handy. Um, and then if we, if we, I, I don't think I actually gave a, a screenshot of the, the clip through to the website, but I got even more information. So I got, his children's names, um, his wealth when he died, 
um, a list of claims for his losses, including the amounts awarded, and then the names of his estates. And it actually tells me that there were, he was compensated for 2,554 enslaved people over six plantations, and he was awarded £26,000. That's worth about two £2.6 million pounds today. And if the name rings a bell, um, it's because this, I think he's the great grandfather of Henry Lassels, who was the husband of Princess Mary and the aunt of Elizabeth II. It just goes to show that, I mean, that this is this is why this project exists. And the, the, the great people at UCL who've worked on this, uh, it's a brilliant resource. I know that it's it seems odd to us today for something like this to happen, for £20 million to be awarded um, to enslavers um, and people involved in the slave trade who benefited from it. Um, and if you come across an ancestor or a relative in these records, it's going to be an uncomfortable moment for you, right? Um, but what I'm trying to say is that we shouldn't shy away from things like this. Um, there are aspects of history and our personal family histories that are quite uncomfortable, but we shouldn't we shouldn't just ignore them. We should process them and accept them. And it means that horrible things don't happen again, basically. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's the legacies of British slavery uh, record set. I think there are about 66, I think about 66,000 records in this. I think if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yeah, it's interesting as well. So um, let me know if you find anything in there as well. And remember to tune back in next week, Thursday the 9th, two o'clock UK time, where I'll be talking to um, somebody from the Legacies of British Slavery Project and we'll go into this in more detail. Wonderful. OK, um, let's do question of the week, shall we? So the question of the week is, who is your most inspiring female ancestor and why? I'm going to scroll all the way back up to the top in the comments because um, I think I might miss some. Um, um, Anya says, my nana, who was the first woman to take her company to court over equal pay in Scotland. She was a very strong woman. and I think those genes were passed on to her daughters, granddaughters and great granddaughter yes i love that i love this so much um oh this was in relation to tina my grandmother who died at 106 wow that's incredible what a life you must have led karen says my great aunt gave up on a teaching job she loved to support her husband in his career she did benefit from a fairly privileged life of travel but he didn't want children as they thought they would hinder his career. And that was always a sadness for her. Oh, I love hearing these stories, you guys. Uh, Kim says, um, my great grandmother, Kathleen, she grew up in the east end of London, took part in a match girl strike. Oh, amazing. Lost her husband to suicide or murder. Sketchy details. Yeah, it could be sketchy. Um, two of her sons were captured in the Second World War. She witnessed the Bethnal Green Tube disaster. She went through so much, but always with a smile. I would be amazed if there was a diary left by her. The things she must have seen. And I just, I love that. I love that you said that, Kim, that, you know, she saw so much and went through, went through a lot, but she was still a lovely, smiley person as well. I just think that's lovely. A uh, couple of people saying they're having trouble playing the video. Oh, no. I hope it's okay. Tell me in the comments if it's okay. Um, okay, 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 okay. Uh, Karen says, Karen says, my great aunt gave up. Wait, I've read this one already. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, Rita says, I have two women, my grandmother who raised nine children in a three bedroom house in Philadelphia and then adopted another boy whose parents had put into an orphanage. My great grandmother who lost her husband and raised three boys on her own. She eventually remarried and had three daughters. Though there were issues, she was able to keep the family together. I love that. These are wonderful. Um, okay. 
Oh, Darren's saying my partner's father was born in Nottingham and was a Catholic. I'll have to look into into the um, the, the Nottingham Catholic records. Yes, you absolutely should. They are so so good. I am a big fan of Catholic records. If I haven't said so already. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Andrew says, um, I've had a look at the slavery records quite a bit about a local major landowner whose cousin, whose gamekeeper was a cousin of mine. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Um, okay, I'm scrolling down now. Any more questions of the week? Um, Ellen says, third great aunt was a teacher at the Wesleyan Female College in the 1850s. She was also noted for her equestrian skills. I love that. A teacher in the 1850s. That's incredible. Andrew says, one of my three times, I think, great grandmothers, took her two children to India to join her husband, who's in the army. The Indian mutiny was still going on. Wow. <laughs> Again, the things you must have seen. Wow. Um, Joe says, possibly my two times great grandmother who died aged 88 in 1949, having buried three husbands and two of her seven children. Also, some of my medieval ancestors who were persecuted for their faith and lost everything. Ironically, there were Huguenots who escaped, escaped France so they could continue to worship their Protestant faith. And others were Catholics who lost everything supporting Mary, Queen of Scots. I really want to find some medieval ancestors. Uh, I at the moment I don't think I've gone my overthrow line I think I've got back as far as when parish records started but you know that there's they, they sometimes talk about finding a gateway ancestor so somebody that's you know it's been written about and is reasonably well known or is part of some 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 slightly more well-to-do family uh, I don't seem to have one of those and I hope one day I will find one and then I will go look further back that's my plan. Um, Georgia says, my great grandmother, Margaret Blythe, who brought up seven children on her own, lived through two world wars as well. This is something I was thinking about just the other day. For those of us who've got um, relatives who were born turn of the century, um, maybe just after. So my great grandfather was born 1896 and he would have he would have lived through two world wars and I don't often think of that and when you stop to think about that about the change they will have seen as well so I think he died I think he died in 76 so yeah he would have seen some great change and I think that would have been very similar for a lot of our relatives who lived around that time just one of the things I randomly think about sometimes um Okay. What is the poster behind you? Looks very interesting. This is actually not mine. This is my husband's. Um, he put it up for me to um, show a slightly, you know, rather than just a white background. Um, it's um, North Britain guide. To, it's like castles of Britain, basically. Um, it's. I think we bought this in a charity shop. Uh, was it a charity shop buy? I think it might have been. Um, but yes, it's got some images of some British castles um, and then you've got a little guide to each one down here. Um, and then there's, there's some more at the top, but you can't see those. I've, I've cut it off um, helpfully. Um, and then you've got, you can't quite see these, but there's um, Margaret, Countess of Warwick over there. And then there's Thomas de Beecham, uh, Earl of Warwick over here. But there you go. That, that, that's my poster. I like castles. Uh, Daphne saying, is, uh, is Jen okay? Jen is very well, Daphne. Thank you. For, she'll be so pleased you asked after her. Um, so Jen is currently in Salt Lake City at the Roots Tech Conference, um, which is super exciting. And she will be around next week for Friday's Live, uh, which is great. So yeah, she'll be around then. Um, Karen, my maternal granddad's mum was like me, a single mum. She went into the workhouse one day, had my granddad the next day and was there for a month. Can't imagine the courage she must have had to do that on her own. It's hard enough these days, but nothing compared to how, how hard it was in 1898. I completely agree with you. Anybody who. Yeah, it, it barely bears thinking about, does it? Um, but yes, very brave. Um 
very obviously very forthright and um yeah just well done <laughs> well done that sounds so that sounds so cliche but we're very proud of our ancestors who um lived through hard times and came out the other end maybe those even who didn't come around the, come out the other end either uh okay yes lots going on in the comments i did grow up surrounded by castles this is totally true um so i grew up in north wales and very close to rivland castle and then i had conwy denby bomari Carnarvon, all of those on my doorstep, and I, 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 I it's, it's, North Wales is actually a great place to grow up if you if you're into history. Um, yeah, it's really nice. Um, it's, it's, I don't know whether I told you all this, but um, when after my wedding in July, my hubby and I went on a little mini moon to um, sort of South Wales. And there are some castles around there that we really want to see. And that's what we did for our mini moon. We went to see some castles. Oh, funny. Um, Darren said, um, I think it would have to be both grandmothers at the, as they had um, nine or ten sons and daughters, each in their 30s and 40s. So nearly 20 children in service during the Second World War. Sadly, two were killed in action. Another as prisoners of war um, and all others in different units. My grandfather's in the commandos. Um, homework like munitions. My father's mother worked on the same factory shift in Newport um, as Ruby Loftus, who was painted by Dame Laura Knight in the painting. That's cool. Don't know why this isn't hiding. Don't know what's happened. I can't remove your comment, I'm afraid, Darren, so we might just have to leave it there. So, oh, it's gone now. There we go. OK. Um, yes, Anya saying she used to work in a castle. Yes, I love castles a lot. OK, yes, it's not uh, it's not hiding the comments again after I'm bringing them up on screen, which is very, very helpful. Um, but yes, so, oh, there we go. It's working now. The gremlins are playing ball again. Lovely. Those were some great answers, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing those. Um, as always, we absolutely love to hear about your wonderful ancestors and why they inspire you. Because I think I think sometimes if we stop and think why they inspire us, like why does this story in particular stick with me in particular, it can really help us shape the person we want to be now and where we want to go. And... I think that's quite powerful. OK, right. what I want to do next is we're going to do a mini tutorial. We are going to have a look at um, a, a feature that we have in our family tree that I think might be quite useful for you. Um, because we all know how frustrating it is when we realise that we've made a mistake on our family tree. And nobody wants to go and have to delete dozens of people and start from scratch. It's really, really annoying. There's actually a handy little feature on our family tree builder that lets you remove somebody just from a family rather than deleting them. And sometimes as well, it will delete everybody else underneath them all together because we don't want that to happen. This means as well that you get to keep all the facts and the events and the media that you have attached to that person. So I've just got a, um, this is a, a, not my actual family tree because I wouldn't play around with it. Um, it just feels like sacrilege. Um, but this is just a, a little mock-up of part of my family tree. Um, so what I, what, let's say, for example, that we've got Ralph Overthrow, who is my great-grandfather over here. Let's say that I've just found out that Elizabeth no we'll go with we'll go with frank we'll say frank wasn't his father lewis frank wasn't his father and i thought he was and it's on the tree and really frustrating but we actually can go in and tweak this eileen saying i need this tutorial today yes i'm hoping this will be useful for you yes okay so what we want to do is we want to go into ralph here okay and
and I'm going to go into view full profile and then I can choose full profile. I want to go to the relations tab. Okay. Then what I want to do, see where it says parents here. If I hover over them, I get this little cracker icon. And if I hover over that, I see remove from this family. Okay. Do you know what? I think we'll do, should we do another this? No, we'll, we'll do, we'll do, we'll, we'll remove this. Okay, so we're going to click, we're going to click on that. And then we're going to click remove from this family only. And then we're going to click remove. Okay. And then that removes him from there like that. And then if we go back, he's gone. But what you'll still find is that if you search for him on the tree, He's still there. It's basically unlinked the two. So it's unlinked this line with the other line. So if we go back and we find Ralph again, if I can actually spell, spell Ralph today. So say this was fine. We wanted to leave it like this. We're meant to do this, etc. cetera. Um, or let's uh, say we came at, came at it from the other perspective. Um, we've done some research and we we've made necessary connections and we actually realized that Lewis should be here. He's already on our tree and he's got loads of people linked to him and we don't want to create a duplicate of Lewis. We just want to add the two lines together, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go into Elizabeth's profile here. I want to go to her full profile. Go back into the relations tab and you can see the family here, okay? So this is how it currently stands. What you want to do is you want to click add spouse. This is where you can customize it a little bit. So say you know that you don't want to add Lewis as uh, the father for Ralph. You can you can uncheck him or you can deselect all of them. You can choose there because the amount of times I've come across a family in a census um, thought that they were all, you know, the mother, the father, the children, etc. And actually, if you do a little bit more digging, you realize that some of the children are from a first marriage and some of the children from a second marriage, and then you need to make necessary tweaks. I'm just going to click continue. Then the key bit here is you don't want to create a new spouse. He's already on the tree. So you just click select somebody from your tree and you search for them. So we're going to search for Lewis, select him, and then click add spouse. There he is. And if you go back into the tree, it's linked the link to the two lines back up for you, just like that. It's quite nifty, actually. Um, it's sort of hidden a bit. So if you don't know it's there, you might not know what it does. Um, but uh, it's a question that I know custom support get quite a lot. And I thought it would be good to show you guys this today, how it works. And I hope it's useful for you, basically. If just one person has learned something today and they can go in and they can tweak their tree, and make the necessary adjustments. I will be really happy. I know sometimes with these tutorials that I'm preaching to the converted um, because you, you, you know, you, you guys know most of this stuff already. Um, but every day is a cool, every day is a cool day. Every day is a cool day. Every day is a school day with family history. The, the, the day we all stop learning, I, I mean, we're always going to be learning. Um, and there's cute little stuff like this that we can try. So there we go. That's that. Um, Kim saying it should help with a few of my blended families. Yeah, it's it is a handy little tool. Um, Sally's saying that's quite nifty. Oh, I need to get rid of the question of the wheat banner. Apologies, everybody. Um, so yeah, that's that. Okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do today was to look at. Um, some uh, cool women from Welsh history because I don't think they get talked about enough, basically. So we're going to look at four Welsh women that I think that you should... But they're, they're really cool, is what I'm trying to say. Um, okay, so we're first going to talk about um, Betsy Cadwallader. Um, 
And what I'm going to do is for each of these four women, we're going to talk a little bit about them, but then we're going to look at where they appear in family history records. Um, because they do, they appear in our family history records, and I sort of love that. And it's it's felt a little bit like a, a treasure hunt for me, looking at these guys. Okay. If you live in North Wales, you might be familiar with Betsy Cadwallader Health Board. Um, I am, but I have never quite understood the significance until about a month ago. <laughs> um, so um, Betsy Cadwallader was a nurse and she lived a pretty cool life for a woman of her time. Um, she was pr she was pretty much working class. Uh, she was born in uh, Flannis Hill, Nibala, in 1789. When she was a teenager, she didn't basically she was rebelling against her parents and she didn't really want the life that um, had been set out for her. And she ran away to Liverpool and she ended up working as sort of a maid and assistant for a ship's captain. And through that, she ended up traveling all over the world. Like we're talking um, South America, Africa, Australia, Um and during that time, she ended up tending to sailors on these journeys as well. So when one of them was injured or fell sick. Then she came back to Britain and then age 55, she decided to train as a nurse. And she trained at um, Guy's Hospital in London. And later on, once she'd finished her training, um, she ended up, apologies, my... Uh, laptop is going a little bit cuckoo there we go um she ended up working with Florence Nightingale and Florence Nightingale was quite a bit younger than Betsy and Florence Nightingale was also quite middle class and they clashed a lot apparently in terms of their approach to nursing so reportedly Betsy was quite adaptable um she wouldn't stick to the rules as much um she would tweak based on each patient and what that condition was whereas Florence was apparently a little bit more no this is how it's done this is how we should do it etc so she served um with Florence during the Crimean War um and she was uh, over in yes she was over there nursing and helping out basically um and uh, I think that she then fell ill and she returned home she wrote an autobiography uh, and then she died uh, in 1860. So let's go and see her in some family history records. Um, so this is her baptism record, which I sort of love. Um, she was baptised Elizabeth um, Cadwallader in 1789. And you've got her father, who is listed as David here. But in pretty much all the literature I've ever read about him, he's David. And then her mother was called, I think that says Judith. I think it says Judith. Um, that's quite an old baptism record. And it, this is before you get the standardisation with the forms with baptisms as well. So this is an extract from a Welsh newspaper in 1858. And one of the things I was reading about Betsy is that when she went to Liverpool, she changed her name. She started going by Elizabeth Davies rather than Elizabeth or Betsy Cadwallader because apparently nobody could pronounce it. Um, so in this newspaper article, she's she's called Elizabeth Davies, right? Um, and because it's in Welsh, I have translated it for you. I was quite pleased. I was about to do about half of this. I could do I translated about half of it without having to resort to Google Translate, which is quite good for me because I'm not fluent in Welsh and it means that I haven't forgotten everything I was taught in school. Um, so this reads, um, died 21st of June at 75 years old, Mrs. Gwen Roberts of Hale Frondeg Banga, daughter of the late respected David Cadwallada Bala and his and sister of Elizabeth Davies, who made herself famous as a nurse in Balaclava, as in during, during the Crimean War. So this is a, a death notice uh, for um, her sister. So, yeah, I quite like our Welsh newspapers. I think they're pretty cool. Um, and I mentioned earlier an autobiography. Um, so this is a uh, an advert in the Monmouthshire Merlin when she released her autobiography. Um, and this is quite detailed. It says, in this true story of a Welsh woman's life, we fancy now 
and then that we're reading fiction by Defoe. The course of events is so natural, yet so unusual and amusing. The whole book is so unlike the majority of stories and biographies that it is in the truest and best sense of the word, a new book. Um, I think that's a lovely little review. I really like that. Um, I really want to try and find her, her autobiography now because, um, yeah, I just think it sounds like a really good read. And again, here she's called Elizabeth Davies, daughter of David Cadwallader, um, not Betsy Cadwallader, as she's uh, she's known to many now. Um, next up, we have Megan Lloyd George. You may have heard of her famous father, but have you heard of her? Um, so her father was the Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Um, she was born in 1902. Uh, she began public engagements at a very young age. And then later on, she became Wales's first female member of parliament in 1929 for the Liberal Party. And she was also um, big on standing up for Wales. Um, she campaigned for a Welsh parliament and also for a, the, a Welsh secretary of state. Um, here she is in the 1911 census. Um I think she's, yeah, she's eight years old here. Um, apologies for cutting off the bottom of the census record. I did not mean to do that uh, when I copied this over. And yes, her father here is Chancellor, Chancellor of the Exchequer, not Prime Minister yet. This is a travel record for her. So this is from 1920, the year before the 1921 census. And she's 17 years old and she's traveling to Marseille with her father, the prime minister. And apparently she did accompany him on a lot of trips like this. And yeah, I just think that was really sweet. There are also some really lovely photos of her from the newspapers. Um, this was at the Estevod in 1931. And then we've got this portrait of her from 1940. And then this was my favourite find for her. Uh, I did not know this until I came across it. Uh, we've got a record collection on Fama Pass called the um, Gestapo Invasion Arrest List from 1940. And basically this was a, a list of enemies that the Nazis put together for if they invaded Great Britain, that they would they would arrest all of these people. And there's loads of people on these lists. Um, and Megan Lloyd George is on the list, and it even says that she's a liberal. <laughs> I thought that was very well, it's it's perhaps amusing to me today that they can but very serious at the time. But this was my favourite find for her. Uh, next up we have Sarah Jane Rees, um, fascinating woman. Um, she grew up as a mariner's daughter. She was born in Llangranog, it's a very Welsh place name, in 1839. Um, and she was one of these young girls who didn't want to be left at home and um, when her father was out at sea and she decided to go with him. And because of this, she became a mariner in her own right which I thought was very impressive. Um, but she was also a teacher. She was a poet. She won awards for her poetry. And she was also a temperance campaigner. She edited a very early Welsh suffrage journal. So in effect, she was an early suffragist. She had um, romantic relationships with two women in her life. Um, quite tragic, actually. The first one, Fanny Reese, died in 1874 from tuberculosis. And apparently, uh, Sarah insisted that Fanny come to stay with her to, to nurse her while she was sick um, until she died, basically. And apparently Fanny died in her arms. And Sarah was so grief-stricken that she couldn't go to Fanny's grave for 12 years or was it place flowers on her grave for 12 years, 12 years it was one or the other but equally it was tragic anyway um, and then she had a relationship with a another woman called Jane Thomas after Fanny's death as well she had a bardic name um so Welsh bards and poets were given bardic names and hers was I don't know if I'm going to even pronounce this correctly Cranogwen I think you'd pronounce that as, um, if anybody can correct me, um, please do. Um, 
I really want a bardic name. I'm not a poet, but I would like one anyway. Um, so this is her in the 1911 census in Llangranog. Um, she lists her occupation as a temperance organiser. It's not that she's a poet. It's not that she's a mariner. And in earlier census records, she does list her, she's listed as a mariner. And then in another one, again, she's listed as a mariner's daughter with her father, which I quite liked. Um, yeah, she can speak both Welsh and English as well, of course. And here are some examples of her mentioned in our newspaper collections. So on the left hand side, we've got her winning best song at the Esteddfod in 1865. And the song that she won an award for was called, I can't remember what it was called now. I want to say something like The Wedding Ring. I think it was something like The Wedding Ring. Yes, it was. I can see it there. Yeah. And then this is a, on the right hand side in 1916 is a mention in the Birmingham Daily Gazette when she passed away. Uh, Welsh woman bard dead, Miss, Mrs. Sarah Jane Meese, a well-known Welsh temperance worker, a Methodist evangelist and prominent bard of the National Eisteddfod, um, when she was familiar, familiarly known as Cranogwen, uh, died at, God, I'm being tested today, Kilthunis near Pontypridd on Saturday. Um, so, yeah, that, that's her. Pretty cool. Now, the last one is my favourite. I appreciate we're probably going to finish a bit early today, but that's OK, because uh, it means you guys can start your weekend early. I absolutely love this woman. OK, this is when I think I've spoken about her before. This is Winifred Cochran. She was born at Gwyrth Castle in 1859. She was a Welsh heiress, basically, and she married the 12th Earl of Dundonald in seven, excuse me, 1878. And apparently it wasn't a very happy marriage. It was apparently arranged. But if you just look at this mini biography I have for her here, this is how you aristocrat, basically. This is how you, if, you, if you're somebody of, of, of standing and wealth, um, this is how you do that. This is how you go out, out and help other people. She spent a great deal of time and money and effort working with a number of charitable causes the hospitals, poor, animals, the elderly. It's just amazing. Um, apparently, she was also a distant re relation of Llewellyn Vow, Llewellyn the Great. Um, she donated land to the Colwyn Bay Community Hospital. She opened the Royal Alexandra in Rill in 1900. Um, I am very familiar with that hospital indeed. Um, I walk past that a lot whenever I go to the beach when I'm in Wales. And... She donated supplies to the Royal Welsh Fusiliers in 1914. She donated to the poor. She was a supporter of the Welsh language, um, member of the NSPCC, contributor of the, of the Women's Institute. She advocated for rights for the elderly and of animals. And then in her will, she gave £5,000 um, for almshouses to be built in Abergelly, which is where... Um, near where Griff Castle is. And if you wonder why Griff Castle sounds familiar, it's because that's where I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here was hosted uh, during lockdown. Apparently she still haunts that castle. But there we go. Let's have a look at her in our family history record. This is her marriage record. I absolutely love this that we have on Find My Past. Um, so you've got her hubby, uh, the Honourable Douglas McKinnon Bailey, Lord Cochrane. He was 25, um, rank or profession, Her Majesty's Service. I think that says Her Majesty's Service. They were both living at Griff Castle during the time, at the time of the marriage. Uh, we've got his father's name there, and his father was a peer of the realm. Of course he was. And then she was 19, she was a spinster, and you've got her father there, Robert Banford Hesketh, a gentleman. And what I quite like with this is that you can see that they were married by the Dean of St. Asaph. That's quite impressive because this was in Saint de la Church. That's quite that's quite a small church. It's, it's not like getting married in St. Asaph Cathedral, for example, which I probably would have imagined. But hey, ho. and Douglas just signed his name as Cochrane. <laughs> Didn't bother signing his full long name. He just put his surname, which I sort of love. And then I don't know about you, but you look at Winifred's signature and it almost looks a little bit shaky to me. And, you know, she was 19. I don't think she wanted this marriage. It didn't turn out very well. I mean, yes, you know, they had children, etc., but they were pretty much estranged. He was away a lot. And 
I don't know if I'm reading too much into it. Um, but then you've got the um, you've got the witnesses' signatures as well. And there are some newspaper reports for her here. So this was for her marriage. Um, it's quite a long article in a local newspaper, the Carnarvon and Denby Herald. And what I quite like here is it's, they've got a little, a little quote from her. Uh, Nothing could possibly give me greater pleasure than the feeling that I have the good wishes of the tenants of the Gwych estate. And I trust that you will thank all of them for their most beautiful gift which I shall place on the table of my new home with great pride and pleasure. She was very involved in her local community. And you can see it just from you know, age 19, getting married. Uh, the local community was very important to her and she to them as well. I think there was there were big um, uh, there were festivities when they got married. Um, it was um, an event that hadn't happened you know, a, a, a big well-to-do wedding, a big event that like, hadn't happened in the local area in some time. Yeah, so that that's that's her marriage. Um, and then you've got the 1911 census. And do you remember earlier when I said that she was born at Gwyrch Castle? Every census record I found for her, so she says she was actually born in Torquay. So I am not sure. If somebody can tell me, that would be amazing. Also, I haven't found her in the 1921 census. If you can find... Winifred Cochrane, Countess Dundonald, um, born probably in Torquay, um, in the 1921 census, and you can send me the link. I would be really, really ha happy. Um, but here she is at Gwyrth Castle. Her husband's not there, as I said. He was away a lot. You've got her with her uh, her son and her two daughters, and then you've got a lot of servants as well. And there were 34 rooms in Griff Castle. It's not small. Um, I, I've mentioned this before, but it's on the it's on the A55. Say if you're driving from um, East Wales over into North West Wales on the along the A55, the North Wales Expressway. If you as, Just as you're coming past Abigail, you can see it on the left-hand side. And it is, it's quite big. It's quite big. Um, so, yeah, that's the census record for her. And then there's some more newspapers as well. And I was spoiled for choice as to what to include here as to her charitable. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Charitable pursuits. So this is her opening the Royal Alexandra Hospital in 1900. And then you've also got in 1914. This was not long um, since the First World War broke out. She donated a fully equipped ambulance to the Red Cross Society, um, including a lot of supplies and anaesthetics to hospitals as well. She did not rest on her laurels, and I sort of love her for that. This is, this, as I said, this is, if you're an aristocrat, this is how, what you should be doing, spending your time with, in my opinion, helping other people. And yeah. I just thought she was amazing. Thank you, Andrew. We're, we're registered in the New St. Abbott district. Yes, so she probably was born in Torquay then. Yes, it was. It's, this, it's exactly the same castle, Liam. Um, interestingly, um, when she, because she was so estranged from her husband and Griff Castle was her inheritance, not her husband's, it was hers. When, when she wrote out her will, she donated she, she gifted, oh, I think, pretty much the entirety of the Greer Castle estate to the king. So her husband wouldn't get it, which is probably a bit mean, really, but hey ho. And um, the king said no. He declined to take it. So then her husband uh, ended up buying the estate back. But yeah, there we go. Some Welsh women from history that I really admire and I hope you have enjoyed that little whistle stop tour. Apologies for not being very erudite today, everybody. I hope next time I do this, uh, I will be feeling a little bit better. And good. I'm pleased you found it interesting, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, it's just a, 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 something a little bit, a little bit relaxing to finish off the week, I think. And oh, I have just just about come up to time, which is good. OK, right. Before we go next week, we've got quite a lot on next week. So you might want to pop these down in your diaries. 
So uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday 7th of March at 5 p.m. UK time, we're going to be hosting an Instagram live with relatively the sibling podcast that we have sponsored for their fourth season. And it's all about sibling relationships. Now, for the fourth season, for all of their guests, um, our wonderful research specialist, Jen Baldwin, and fellow Friday's live host, she's been doing research into the guests' family trees. So now it's the host's turn, Catherine Carr. Jen has been looking into Catherine's family tree, and it's time to deliver the findings. So we're going to be talking all about family history records and Catherine's family tree. So please do tune in to us for that um, our five o'clock UK time on Tuesday on Instagram. This will not be hosted on the platforms we're currently watching on now. And then on Thursday, the night at the slightly earlier time of 2 p.m., I apologise that we haven't been able to keep any of these for 4 p.m. I'm a creature of habit, just like all of you. 2 p.m. on Thursday. Come back here to either Facebook, YouTube or Twitter. And I'm going to be talking to Jess Hannah from the Legacies of British Slavery Project at University College London. And we're going to be talking all about the record set that we've added this week. So the Legacies of British Slavery. I didn't go into very much detail. We're going to go into, into a lot more and it'll be really good. And I'm really excited, actually. And then, of course, Jen will be back at four o'clock UK time, proper time, uh, next Friday for Friday's Live. And um, so, yeah, that's that. That's what we've got coming coming up next week. Um, you've been enjoying the podcast, Karen. I'm so pleased. Um, one of my favourite episodes was the episode for Manny and Ruben Co. I sobbed while listening to that. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, Daphne, do we have a? Do you have to have an Instagram account? I'm not sure if you do. Okay, I, I, let me look into that one for you. Um, George is saying thank you very much for an interesting talk. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yes, we will end on those sentences exactly. Have a fabulous, restful, family history filled weekend, everybody, and we will see you next week. Take care of yourselves and bye bye.